Hello! Today I'm going to talk about the menstrual cycle. I am going to review in detail the different stages of the menstrual cycle, delving into the hormonal changes that occur and the impacts it has on menstrual symptoms and fertility. So for those of you who are new to following me, my name is Dr. Sarah Narrows. I am a naturopathic physician with an interest in hormonal health. So let's get started. So by convention, we call the first day of your period day one of the cycle. The cycle is divided into two phases, the follicular phase, which begins with the onset of your period and ends on the day before what we call the luteinizing hormone surge, so right before ovulation. The luteal phase begins on the day of the LH surge and ends with the beginning of your next menstrual cycle. So the average adult menstrual cycle lasts 28 to 35 days with approximately 14 to 21 days in the follicular phase and 14 days in the luteal phase. And there's relatively little variability in cycle length when women are between the ages of 20 to 40 years. However, there can be quite a bit of cycle variability in the first five to seven years of one cycle and in the 10 years before a woman's period stops. So to understand the menstrual cycle, we really need to understand the roles of the various hormones involved. And I'm going to illustrate how they change over the course of the menstrual cycle, how they work together, and their actions. So to start, we have estrogen. And to be specific, this chart is representing estradiol. We have three different types of estrogen, and estradiol is the strongest of the estrogens. We have progesterone, we have follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone, and those two are known as FSH and LH. So starting in the early follicular phase, this is right when you're starting your period, estrogen and progesterone concentrations are low. And because these hormones are low, we start to see an increase in a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is released from a part of our brain called the hypothalamus. And this signals to our pituitary, which is a small pea-sized gland in the brain, to release follicle stimulating hormone. So you can see this on the chart, the follicle stimulating hormone. Now follicle stimulating hormone is responsible for the recruitment of the next group of developing follicles in the ovary. And a follicle is a fluid-filled sac that contains the immature egg, or what we call oocyte. So this is relevant when a woman is being assessed for fertility because some specialists using an ultrasound will count the number of follicles developing in those ovaries to determine what we call the antral follicle count. When these follicles are developing, they produce serum inhibin B, which suppresses the rise of FSH, as you can see along the chart. Now, these antral follicles also secrete anti-malarian hormone known as AMH. This is a marker of ovarian health and aging, and AMH has gained widespread attention for its use in assessing women's ovarian reserve, and of course is an important measurement of um, when you're investigating infertility. Now we're at the mid-follicular phase. And this is where things get a little bit more complicated and we start to see how the hormones work together and the intricacies of their relationship. So the slight increase in FSH stimulates the follicles to develop, which we call folliculogenesis, and the production of estrogen via the granulosa cells. So granulosa cells are found in the developing follicle. And through a process called aromatization, they actually turn androgens into estradiol. So you can start to see that estrogen increasing. And estrogen causes the lining of our uterus to grow and thicken. So at this stage, you see that lining, which is called the endometrium, become thicker. Increased estrogen, again, has that negative feedback on the brain and results in the suppression of FSH and LH concentrations. So you can see that on the chart. Now we're progressing into the late follicular phase. We continue to see that daily increase in estradiol and inhibin A, which is released by the growing follicle. And in the week before ovulation, FSH and LH take a slight decline. 
Now, the increasing estrogen results in what we call kind of an increase um, in the stringiness of cervical mucus. So many women start to notice a change around ovulation in cervical mucus. And the stringiness of cervical mucus is thought to be an important, um, or it, it helps with sperm transit in the uterus, ensuring that they get to the fallopian tubes and they can fertilize the egg. Now, out of um, all of the follicles that are growing, a dominant one is selected. And this is when we reach the luteal phase and the start of the mid-cycle surge and ovulation. So estrogen levels continue to rise until approximately one day before ovulation. And at this point, the mid-cycle surge, we see a tenfold increase in luteinizing hormone concentrations and a smaller rise in FSH. Now this LH surge initiates a substantial change in the ovary. The immature egg or oocyte is released approximately 36 hours after that LH surge. Ovulation does cause slight pain for some women. It's often described as a one-sided sharp or um, dull cramp. And a fun fact, medically it is referred as Mittelschmerz, which in German means middle pain. So if you are trying to get pregnant, knowing when you ovulate is really important. Many women use the urinary LH strips to determine when they've ovulated. And the LH strips tell you when you start to peak, right? When that LH is elevated. So it's important to determine when in your cycle you're ovulating and to plan intercourse such that the chances of the egg being fertilized is the highest. When the oocyte or egg is released, it lasts for about 12 to 24 hours. So if you're trying to get pregnant, you want to have intercourse right when you detect the LH surge. Even more optimally, you can time intercourse for the two days prior to the expected LH surge and ovulation. And this is because sperm can last in the uterus for a maximum of five days. So you want them almost waiting there in the fallopian tubes for when that egg is released. Of course, if you don't want to get pregnant, know that the days prior to and the day of and after ovulation is when you are most fertile. All right, let's talk about the middle to late luteal phase. So even before the oocyte is released, the granulosa cells begin to secrete progesterone. And this is stimulated by LH. Progesterone is essential for making the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, optimal for implantation of the fertilized egg. In some women, they experience a reduced or reduction in progesterone in the luteal phase, and, and this can sometimes be referred to as a luteal phase defect. Now, the changes in estrogen and progesterone during the middle to the late luteal phase is also thought to play a role in um, causing premenstrual syndrome, commonly known as PMS. There are numerous symptoms that have been attributed to PMS, including mood swings, tender breasts, food cravings, fatigue, irritability, and low mood. And these typically occur 5 to 11 days before the onset of your period. While the exact cause of PMS is not fully understood, it is thought that both changes in hormones and neurotransmitters play a role. A deficiency of progesterone and its metabolites, which um, have an anti-anxiety type property to them, have been proposed as a possible cause of PMS. However, what's perplexing is that women with PMS have similar hormone levels as those who do not have PMS. So what the current understanding or belief is, is that women with PMS have an abnormal response to the changes in hormone levels. What we also know is that estrogen and progesterone cause changes in the neurotransmitter serotonin, commonly known as our happy neurotransmitter. When estrogen levels fall, so do serotonin levels. And this is believed to be one of the contributing factors to the mood changes that occur with PMS. So we still have a lot to learn about the cause of PMS. And as you can tell, the menstrual cycle is complex and every woman's experience of the menstrual cycle um, can be different. So during the luteal phase, prostaglandins are produced in the ovary, fallopian tube, and uterus. Now, prostaglandins are compounds involved in inflammation, and they're often you know, thought to be a negative thing. However, they play a key role in ovulation, 
fertilization of the egg, and implantation into the endometrium. And that's why for women who are trying to get pregnant, it is generally recommended that they do not take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So NSAIDs, an example would be ibuprofen, um, as this inhibits the natural inflammatory process elicited by prostaglandins, which is needed for ovulation and implantation. So if you are taking um, NSAIDs and are trying to get pregnant, this would be worthwhile talking to your healthcare provider about. Now, if the egg is fertilized in the fallopian tube and it travels down to the uterus and implant, implants into the endometrium successfully, the cells of the developing egg start to produce HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This is what's measured when determining if a woman is pregnant early on. So the urine pregnancy tests or the blood tests all measure HCG. And HCG signals to the corpus luteum to continue to produce progesterone, which maintains that thick lining of the uterus and adequate blood supply. Now, if there is not enough progesterone, this can result in a miscarriage. That is why for some women who are struggling with fertility, they will be prescribed progesterone. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone until the placenta takes over at about seven to nine weeks of gestation. Now, if there is no fertilized egg and there is no rise in HCG, the corpus luteum will eventually decay 10 days after ovulation and stop producing progesterone and estradiol. The loss in estradiol and progesterone results in a reduced blood supply to the endometrium and what we call endometrial sloughing, which I don't particularly like that term, but that's what we call it. And it triggers the onset of the menstrual cycle. So the process of losing the endometrium releases prostaglandins, the inflammatory compounds, and that's what's responsible for um, causing cramps, which so many women experience. It's um, the prostaglandins also cause some intestinal cramping, which can result in looser stools during your menstrual cycle. So this completes the menstrual cycle. I hope that you found this video informative. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. Um, stay posted for more videos and articles on hormone health, including hormonal changes during perimenopause, PCOS, and post-pregnancy. And of course, if there's anything you'd like to learn, let me know. Thank you for listening.